Hello everyone, I'm uh, coming back to the same topic I did yesterday around Jordan Peterson. This time I'm focusing in on an interview that he had uh, also recently with uh, Channel 4, which is a news network, uh, a television network out of uh, Britain. Um, this is a longer interview than the uh, Wendy Mesley CBC interview that I just did a video of. Um, so as I am anticipating, this is going to be a, a multi-part video simply because this is 30 minutes long. The source video is, and uh, when I worked on the CBC interview, which is just around 11 minutes or so, my end video ended up being about 40. So uh, I don't want to make a video that's going to be close to two hours. Um, so I'm going to cut it up. Uh, I'll try and find a natural spot to break, and I'm going to try and keep these. Uh, my target is within 30 minutes or so. So... Uh, we'll just move on and, and sort of, uh, like I said, I'm just playing it a little bit by ear here, but basically, um, so this was a very uh, controversial interview. It certainly made a lot of waves in uh, online anyway. Um, and it's an interview, again, this is, I believe it's all part of the promotional side of this book tour that Jordan Peterson's currently on. Um or at least was, you know, very close to that period anyway. So, um, and, and it's a very, it's, I think, uh, let me just start from being frank. Let me be frank from the beginning. It's a bad interview. Um, it, there are a lot of problems with the structure of the interview and, and also the information that the interviewer uh, is throwing into the conversation, especially uh, a some of these asides that'll get thrown and I'll stop and point them out as they happen. Um, and also for a great deal of the interview, the, she wasn't listening, uh, to what he was saying. So, uh, because she had this, you know, she came into the interview with a agenda. There was a specific purpose to this interview. Uh, but let me start the interview up and, uh, let me uh, transition over here and, uh, we can get going and I'll talk after we get the introduction set up. Jordan Peterson, you've said that men need to, quote, grow the hell up. Tell me why. Well, because there's nothing uglier than an old infant. There's nothing good about it. it. People who don't grow up don't find the sort of meaning in their life that sustains them through difficult times, and they are certain to encounter difficult times. And they're left bitter and resentful and without purpose and adrift and hostile and resentful and vengeful and arrogant and deceitful and and of no use to themselves and of no use to anyone else and no partner for a woman and there's nothing in it that's good. So you say, I mean, that sounds pretty bad. You're saying it's there's a bad. crisis of masculinity? I mean, what do you do about it? You tell, you help people understand why it's necessary and important for them to grow up and adopt responsibility, why that isn't a shake your finger and get your act together sort of thing, why it's more like, why it's more like, uh, a delineation of the kind of destiny that makes life worth living. I've been telling young men, and, but it's not, I wasn't specifically aiming this message at young men to begin with. It just kind of turned out that way. But. And it's mostly, you admit, it's mostly men listening. I mean, it 90% is. of your audience is a man. Well, it's right? about 80% on, on YouTube, which is a, YouTube is a male domain primarily. So it's hard to tell how much of it is because YouTube is male and how, how much of it is because of what I'm saying. Okay, I uh, just wanted to stop there because there's a couple of things that he mentions that uh, I wanted to comment on. Um, so, one, uh, the whole start of this interview is talking specifically about uh, his new book, um, which he has out in all... Uh, I can't remember the title of it. I haven't picked it up, uh, although I think I may be going to at some point. But anyway, the gist of the book is um, a... Uh, a series of lessons, I think, for younger men, I believe, uh, I, I think it is targeted specifically towards young men, um, but about how to, as he says, get their lives in order and you know, grow up. Um, because he identifies an issue of a lot of youth not having really taken control of their lives and instead they're tending to define themselves by some very harmful uh, you know, cults of ideology that are sort of out there. Um, so really his target audience is uh, the youth that are feeding some of this alt-right movement. And 
uh, which is a, 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 you know, it's a noble endeavor, although, again, I don't under, quite understand, and this is, again, because I don't, I haven't read the book, I'm just really kind of learning about the context of, of what he's written about and what his thoughts are through some of the interviews that I've seen, so I certainly am not going to profess any sort of expertise in, in what his thoughts are. Um, but just in observation of what I've seen in some of the interviews, and, and in this interview in particular, um, in the way that he talks, um, I don't quite understand. It's not clear why he decided to focus his discussion about lessons on how to mature and grow up and you know, be a, you know, an adult um, in, in a modern society, uh, why he decided to restrict it to just a single gender. Uh, but and and the fact that he does causes, but like I said, I think it causes both some confusion in the interview itself, and it also um, creates a separation that I'm not sure for a lot of what he's talking about is not a good thing in a sense because you're actually creating a separation when he's when he's only talking about men and he's leaving women out of the equation. It leaves his argument open to mis uh, open to more misinterpretation than I think is necessary, but uh, let's keep playing here uh, and, and we'll come back to this point. But um, you, you, what I've been telling young men is that there's an actual reason why they need to grow up, which is that they have something to offer, you know, that, that, that people have within them this capacity to set the world straight and that's necessary to manifest in the world and that also doing so is where you find the meaning that sustains you in life. So what's gone so, wrong then? Oh God, all sorts of things have gone wrong. I, I think that, I don't think that young men are, hear words of encouragement, some, some of them never in their entire lives, as far as I can tell, that's what they tell me. And the fact that the words that I've been, that I've been speaking, the YouTube lectures that I've done and put online, for example, have had such a dramatic impact is an indication that young men are starving for this sort of message because like why in the world would they have to derive it from a lecture on YouTube? No, they're not being taught that they, that it's important to develop yourself. But does it, does it bother you that your audience is predominantly male? Does that, isn't, isn't that a bit divisive? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's no more divisive than the fact that YouTube is primarily male and Tumblr is primarily well, that's pretty divisive, female. Isn't well, it? Tumblr is primarily female. Okay, uh, I just want to stop there. I, 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 he mentioned this twice now about YouTube being a male, uh, loca you know, male place on the internet. Um, and it might be, st it's probably statistically true. Um, I'll, I tend to give him the benefit of the doubt when it comes to statistical facts and whatnot, just because it does appear that he's done a lot of that research. Uh, I personally haven't looked myself, and I probably could do a little bit of digging and just find out what that is but anyway my point being though is I think it's not a uh, one just because the majority of the population on a site on the internet is predominantly one makeup today doesn't mean that that, that that's a guarantee that's going to continue and in fact if the environment YouTube is not a I mean YouTube as a site and as, as an architecture is, is it's not just gender neutral it's subject neutral um it's just a framework in many ways for posting and sharing uh video online in a, in a and, and the community that can evolve around that uh, and in fact although statistically you might be true that the vast majority of people on youtube may today even still be primarily male users that is certainly not the case um when you break it down by you know, subject category or, or you know, and, and certainly some areas of, of the YouTube are far more uh, female friendly or even female dominant. So uh, in this, much the same way, I'm sure Tumblr is very, this, very much the same in, in the opposite. Statistically, there's probably far more women that use Tumblr than there are men. But again, there are areas of Tumblr that will be male, uh, you know, both either, you know, equal with men and women or, or majority men as opposed to majority women. Uh, and that's true of any uh, place on the internet, at least unless there's a, a, a place that is specifically targeting a, a gender. Uh, so it, it's, um, I think I get the point of uh, that he's talking about just that's, you know, those are the people that will find him because that's the majority of the people who are using the, who might have the chance to find him on YouTube. But I, I think 
he 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 by going to the point of now tailoring your message to that audience, you're increasing the likelihood that that will stay the same or even increased you will you will become even more on the, on the male side of the audience which i think is a shame because much of what he's talking about uh, in the interviews that i've seen and the and some of the lectures that i've watched on his youtube channel um are not gender specific or at least if they are they're not meant to be there are aspects that uh are applicable across all audiences so like i said it's just it's a, it's a small point um and, and one of the areas where i disagree with how he presents his argument is that is this fact that he has you know, at least I, mean, I guess it's uh, it's it's a you know balanced by the fact that of course he has a new book out and he is promoting the book so of course the topic of much of the conversation to right around now will be topic toward you know targeted towards men um, but I, again I hope that this means you know, I hope he takes the opportunity at some point to address the other half of the po- you know, population that he's that he's uh, you know essentially. Uh, uh, separated from his conversation um but let's continue on and we'll we'll return to this as well but you're just saying that's the way it is well it's i'm not saying anything it's just an observation that that's the way it is um there's plenty of women that are watching my lectures and coming to my talks and buying my books it's just that the majority of them happen to be men uh it's what's in it for the women though well what sort of partner do you want you want an overgrown child or do you want someone to contend with that's going to help you and so you're you saying rely on. women have some sort of duty to sort of help fix the crisis of masculinity? Well, it depends on what they want. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly, exactly how I laid it out. Like, uh, women want, deeply want men who are competent and powerful. And, and I don't mean power in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that they can exert tyrannical control over others. That's not power. That's just corruption. Power is competence. And why in the world would you not want a competent partner? Well, I, I know why, actually. You can't dominate a competent pow- partner. So, so if you want women domination. Want to dominate, is that what you're saying? No, I'd say women who have had their relationships impaired with, impaired, their relationships with men impaired and who are afraid of such relationships will settle for a weak partner because they can dominate them. But it's a suboptimal solution. Do you it think that's no what a lot of women good. do? Okay, sorry, I just wanted to stop it there. Um, so this is basically the, the beginning of where the conversation starts to switch into this two conversations talking past each other to some degree, more so on the journalist side than on his side. Um, but it, it does happen in that cause he's talking about the average woman and the average man in the situation. How, cause, because the, the majority of women today do many of the same uh that take up many of the same roles that women have tr- traditionally taken over the, you know the, hist- the history of much of our species uh, so and men likewise do the same that said nothing what he's talking and nothing about what he's talking about is trying to claim that all women must fill those roles and all men must fill these roles. And yet that's the interpretation that she's trying to push on him. And again, this is, is, so this is not a conversation, at least on her part, for the vast majority of this interview. This is her trying to drive that narrative that this is a person, this is a man who's telling women that your place is in the kitchen and you need to find a man who will respect you and dominate you. This is the message that, that you know, and, and variations of this message are what she's trying to paint uh, Jordan Peterson as being a proponent of. And it's, and again, he, he I, I, to give him credit, he handles this tack with, far more patience than uh you know certainly i would have if i was being you know presented with questions and information the way that this interview goes um and 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 he like i said the the thing that i i've I've appreciated by listening to him talk isn't so much what he's saying but how he's uh 
how he's communicating, how he's he, how he's handling, you know, controlling his own behavior as well as how he's listening and engaging to what the person is saying and trying to steer the conversation into a more constructive areas. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the uh, again, this is far. You know, I think I use to go back to my uh, CBC interview that I did yesterday. Um, I. I think I even used the term hit piece at one point in there. And then I want to just sort of apologize. It's not, I guess I should have been more accurate. And what I could have said was, uh, it's this type of behavior that is often used in hit pieces. Now, this particular interview is far more clearly a planned, a pre-planned attack trying to get an opponent off balance and admit to some form of hidden agenda, hidden bias, um, which fair enough. And, uh, you know, is a reporter's right. The reporter is to, trying to ferret out the truth, but the reporter also has a responsibility to listen to the responses of their, of the person who they're in, sitting in front of and making sure that the, the entire conversation has cohesion. And there are num numerous points that will be, we'll, we'll find, we'll see very shortly where she brings in either a quote that he's made from elsewhere or some statistic or some piece of information that's from external and then tries to, re, you know, anytime she's starting to find resistance from what he's saying, she'll try and redirect and get back onto this narrative that, again, it, it takes a really long time. And I'm not even clear at the end of the interview if she changed her, her opinion that perhaps this guy doesn't hold these these beliefs. But at least, like I said, there does seem to be, only at the very end of the interview does it start to be some form of understanding between the two uh, but i'll point out that when we get there in another uh well probably in a video or two i think there's a substantial okay, let's and rewind a little bit impaired and who are afraid of such relationships will settle for a weak partner because they can dominate them but it's a suboptimal solution do you think that's no what a lot of women good. are doing i think there's a substantial minority of women who do that and i think it's very bad for them they're very unhappy it's very bad for their partners although the partners get the advantage of not having to take any responsibility. But what gives you the right to say that? I mean, maybe that's how women want their relationships, those women. I mean, you're making these vast generalizations. I'm a clinical psychologist. Right, so you've, you're saying you've done your research and women are unhappy dominating men. I didn't say they were unhappy dominating men. I well, said you... it was a bad long-term solution. Okay, you said it was it's making the them miserable. Thing. Yes, it is. And it depends on the time frame. I mean, there can be, there's intense pleasure in momentary domination. That's why people do it all the time. But it's no formula for a long-term, successful long-term relationship. That's reciprocal, right? Any long-term relationship is reciprocal, virtually by definition. So... Let me put a quote to you from the... Okay, so just want to stop it there again, too. So I, I think we've laid out the fra framework. It's certainly, um, Jordan Peterson's done a good job of sort of laying out the... Um, the basic premises of his argument, I think, at least within the context of this conversation. Um, but as you see, this is the very first time that she brings in a piece of information that's not related to the conversation at hand. So she's, you know, and this is, you know, probably true with a lot of interviews. And this isn't just reporting. This you you have notes, you have talking points, and things that you want to talk about in an interview. Um, there's very few people who. Even in, say, like late night talk, show, talk shows, you have a similar sort of thing where you have a set of notes and you'll mostly, you often see any papers that a, that a host on a late night talk show is shuffling on their desk. Those are notes for the, uh, that tells them about who the person is they're about to interview with questions and, and you know, interesting p details about the person's life or, or things like, you know, things that they can bring if they think the conversation is heading towards a, a dead zone, they'll, they'll pick on one of those notes and, and talk about it. And, get, you know, and start the conversation. It's like I said, it's a way to keep the conversation going. Uh, from a reporter's perspective, it's it's it can be slightly different. Of course, you when you've got an, an you know a number of points that you want to cover in an interview and the number of topics that you want to dig into and get you know understand the person's opinion or, or get them to, to talk about stuff. Um, but like I said, a lot of um, news these days isn't focused so much about ferreting out. Like I said, the 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 naked truth, the honest truth. Instead, it's about they've got a preconceived story uh, put in place, uh, a story, a narrative that they already, even before they sit down, they already know what the narrative is that they want to put up on camera, on screen. And 
so they you know when the, the narrative doesn't when the when the actual interviewee isn't fitting that narrative it can start to go wrong really quickly and that's what happens in this interview i think um anyway um i'm gonna stop it right there i think and i'll uh i apologize for this being a uh a, a, like i said we haven't really dug into the meat of it here but th like i said this is going to be something that i'm going to take a long time um dissecting it because it's it, this type of interview it's like i said it's, it's not so much about the specifics of this interview is why i'm focusing on this it's more about the conversation in in news in general uh and how a breakdown in communication like, you know like a, a global breakdown in dialogue and reasonable rational discussion um is causing this extreme uh, extremism in many forms both left and right in in all sorts of places of the world and it's reactionary it's it's not like i said it's not rational it's not intelligent it's emotional it's it's fear and anger lashing out and and we have to put a stop to this we can't feed this and the media has an important role in this it's important that our media doesn't um feed the flames of this fear and anger and and, and in spends its business its entire focus on informing its its viewers informing the people that it's trying to serve um it, news is not a product is not intended to be a product for sale it's intended to be uh, i mean it was originally um it was it was legislated it was required if you wanted to broadcast tv if you wanted to have the right the federal the federal government wouldn't let you if you didn't have a news program um, and when you have public broadcasting like CBC, it was required to have news. So anyway, that's a completely different discussion, but it's a start. So uh, we will come back tomorrow with a part two of this. Um, and uh, we will, and if you want to watch the entire interview, I'll put the link will be down at the bottom in the description of this video. Uh, so thanks again for uh, watching and we'll see you next time.